Hi everyone, it's Blake with ChessPathways.com, back again today for another game analysis video. As always, please feel free to check out ChessPathways.com if you want your own games analyzed. We have contests going on, and it's completely free to sign up. This game was sent to me by a player with the Chess.com username Knights Heron, and uh, they did some things really well here. They sent me a game that they lost and struggled with and had questions about, they annotated the game, they gave all their thoughts for most of their moves, and this was a longer time control game. So those, those three things are really important when it comes to analyzing a game and getting the most out of it. So let's get started. It looks like Knight's Heron played the opening fine. So Knight's Heron was white here. d4, d5, c4, e6, knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, bishop b4, and the exchange on d5. And Knight's Heron mentioned he was happy to see this move because black kind of loses their control of the center, and white's going to be able to play e4 at a later point and get kind of complete control of the center. And that's probably true. So this is the Ragozin variation right here, uh, kind of combining some uh, Nimzo Indian ideas with the Queen's Gambit declined. Uh, but after c takes d5, knight takes d5 is not very often played. Usually black tries to keep their stronghold in the center and recapture with a pawn. So after knight takes d5, bishop d2, just calmly defending the threats of this knight. There were two attackers and, and one defender on that guy, so you have to reinforce it. Knight c6, and pawn to a3. Just putting the question to that bishop. And black takes on c3, and Knight Heron mentioned that he thought that black gave away the bishop pair here for no reason. Which, yeah, I would agree. And I like Knight Heron's decisions here to take back with the pawn. Uh, not taking back with the bishop, because remember, white's going to get a space advantage here. White's getting ready to play e4, and when you have a space advantage, usually keeping pieces on the board is in your favor. Because your pieces are going to have a lot more room to maneuver than your opponent's pieces, which are going to be tripping all over each other because there's not enough space for them. So... B takes c3, a6, yeah, this is kind of silly. Black's kind of wasting time here in the opening. I've talked about this kind of move in a lot of my videos. And white goes ahead with their plan and plays pawn to e4. Knight b6, bishop b3, so white's just developing. White, uh, white's playing the opening great here. They're following the three you know, key opening principles. They're controlling space in the center, they're developing their pieces, and they're about to get castled. So just from, from a purely classical you know, three opening principles perspective, White is outplaying black so far. So nothing to criticize here. H6, yeah, black's just wasting a lot of time. And white gets castled. Okay, black plays knight to e7 now. Um, and knight Terran mentioned they thought this was kind of a strange retreating move. Yeah, it kind of is. Uh, I guess black wants to free the c-pawn. Uh, and you mentioned that and said you weren't too scared of it. Yeah, it's not really anything to be afraid of. It's kind of hard to find a good plan for black now at this point, though. They're just kind of behind in development. They don't have much space for their pieces. Like, where's this knight really supposed to go? You've kind of taken away all of its all of its good squares. Anyway, knight e7, queen c2, bishop d7, and now you play a4. And I saw this pawn kind of became a weakness later. You do have to kind of be aware of this when you push this pawn, because black can play a5 and fix the pawn on your square. I know you were trying to go for, you know, a4 and pushing the pawn to a5 and taking away even more squares from your opponent, which definitely looks appealing, and black shouldn't allow this. But this pawn is an isolated pawn, right? It's the only isolated pawn on the board, actually. Every other pawn has pawns adjacent to it. So pushing it forward and risking it getting fixed on its square here, it's not terrible. And black black gives up some, some control of the b5 square themselves when they play this pawn to a5 move. But it's just something to be aware of. I'm wondering if you didn't take into account your opponent's possibilities when you played the move uh, pawn to a4 and were just excited about your own ideas here of pushing forward and kicking that knight away to the 8th rank, <laughs> which which looks nice. Just always important to always ask yourself, what's my opponent going to do if I make this move? Just like I talk about in my move-by-move -move guide to chess thinking that every Chess Pathways member gets. Um, so I'm curious if you uh, didn't see a5, or if, if that took you by surprise, or if you thought your opponent would play a5 here, but you just weren't too concerned about it. Either way, I don't think this is a huge deal right now. It's just something to keep in mind that your pawn is, is isolated. Anyway, so you play a4. They do play a5. And here, yeah, you, you make a very interesting comment here. You said you had to do something, and you weren't sure how to make progress. Yeah, this happens all the time. You've played the opening principles great, and this is the part of the game a lot of players struggle with. You've outplayed your opponent in the opening, so now what do you do? How do you make use of all these advantages you've gotten? As we know, when you have a lead in development, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. Your opponent's going to catch up in development, so you have to come up with a plan here that's going to put your better pieces to good use. And here you kind of went wrong. You played c4, which by itself doesn't look horrible, but let's just see how the game progresses for a bit. You kind of, you know, you move your bishop to another square, you put it to e5, it gets kicked away. Uh, knight b4, and now black gets to exchange some pieces off the board, and you felt kind of frustrated, right? You felt like you did everything right in the opening, 
And now, yeah, white's still better here, probably, but it's it's not it's, it's not exactly what you had in mind. Why couldn't you, you know, put your opponent away and get a huge advantage after you outplayed them so well for the first, you know, 12, 13 moves of the game? Go back a couple moves, and I'll talk about the plan that I would have probably played. So let's let's go here uh, instead of c4. So the most obvious plan to my eyes is to play something like knight e5 and play f4, f5. Uh, this does many good things. This gets your rook into the game. It's a natural way to develop your rook. A lot of times, people won't really know how to develop their rooks in these kind of positions, and they'll just kind of, you know, put them on, on some open file. But really, pawn breaks are really important when it comes to opening up the position and making use of your leading development. And it's kind of hard to find good pawn breaks here. D5, maybe. But I kind of like this F4, F5 idea, just getting an another pawn involved in the action, getting your rook into the game. And it seems kind of hard for black to respond to this well. For example, let's say black castles, we play f4, yeah, how, do, how does black really respond to this? They can play f6 and kick our knight away, but this, this seems weakening in, in itself. And now we just kind of have even a, a much bigger center than we had before, and now this pawn could be a weakness. We have the option to always look for any of these pawn breaks, to prepare them however we want, to take our time, and I kind of like this position for white. I think white's much better here. Let's go back to the game line, though, after you played c4, which makes sense too, grabbing more space. Yeah, black plays knight b to c8. Yeah, black's, black's playing really passive. Bishop f4, knight c6. But yeah, now now we kind of regret playing this move a4 because there's this outpost in our position. a4 and c4 probably aren't two plans that go together just because it's kind of annoying to give up this outpost. Um, now a knight's going to swing in there. Maybe we should just bring our bishop back to d2, though. Because uh, it doesn't really do too much here on f4, honestly. Bishop e5. Yeah, yeah, and, and you say that, uh, let, let's see what your comments here are. You, you think f6 is going to weaken their kingside more? Yeah, but they don't, they don't have to play f6, do they? They could exchange on e5, and maybe now you go back to the kind of plan I was talking about with knight takes e5 and f4, f5, which, which looks good, although I would prefer to do it with more pieces on the board, like I was talking about before. I would rather have this pawn back on c3, and this knight would be completely restricted, and keep more pieces on the board instead of offering this exchange of, of knight for bishop. Either way, white, white, white is better there, and black does play f6. Unfortunately, black gets to exchange off some pieces. And remember, when you have a space advantage, one of the things your opponent wants to do is exchange off pieces. Because imagine black couldn't exchange off pieces at all in this position. Look at their minor pieces, they're horrible. Right? If this knight was completely restricted, if this knight, if this pawn was still back on c3, this knight would have absolutely nothing to do. The, the, the black minor pieces are just horrible, and this is true, you know, a lot of times when you have a space advantage. That's why you don't want to offer exchanges. Your pieces are going to have more room to maneuver. Anyway, knight to b4, queen b3, castle. Yeah, and here, uh, yeah, I'm kind of thinking along similar lines as you. You played bishop d2 here, but you said maybe you should have retreated this bishop first. I'm not sure why, why black didn't exchange when they had the chance. You did say you were kind of getting low on time. You had 15 minutes left on your clock. So it is, it, I mean, it seems like it's a fairly long time control for an online game. But, of course, anyone who's played tournaments before knows 15 minutes isn't really that much time. Uh, but you don't want to make bad decisions based on time trouble or seek exchanges just based on, you know, I, I don't want to run low on time. Let's simplify the position. Because in, in this position, simplifying the position is going to remove a lot of your advantages. I think it's always important to try to find the best moves based on your position. So I, I probably would have considered something here, like just retreating this bishop, um, maybe to e2, and then just bringing the bishop back next turn and forcing this knight away. Instead, you played bishop d2 right away, and your opponent was able to exchange pieces. So okay, your, your advantage has diminished a little bit, but white is still definitely better here. You still have the whole center. Black has managed to get castled, and seeking that exchange does free up some of their pieces to find decent squares, maybe. But either way, white is still clearly better here. Bishop e8, interesting. Okay, so the bishop's trying to kind of swing around to these weak light squares around the king and maybe increase the pressure on your center. And you play d5, which I don't think is a bad move, but you made an interesting comment here and said, what else to do? So whenever you have the whole center here, you never have to really push any particular one of the pawns. You can always kind of, you know, prepare each one of the pawn advances, each pawn break. They might have different advantages in different positions. Um, or you can leave your whole center here and just control all these all these nice squares in the center. So I don't I don't really see a rush here to advance these pawns. I would probably just start putting your rooks on on good on good files. It looks like this rook here on on f1 is your worst place piece. So you could go ahead and improve it. You can put it really on any file. I can see arguments for putting it on any other square except where it is on f1. So whenever you're looking for improvements to make to your position, you don't have to rush advances in the center unless there's a compelling reason to. One of the questions I like to ask that I do talk about on my guide is, what is my worst place piece? 
And here I think it's the rook, and I think an, an obvious move is to improve it. But you do play d5, and your opponent plays e5, keeping the center closed up. And here you play rook a to b1, so you're undefending this pawn, but if black takes here, you're just going to take on b7, and probably that favors you. You know, lines are starting to open up, and your rooks can start infiltrating, and black's rooks are horribly disconnected. But after black defends that pawn, you forgot <laughs> to defend your a4 pawn again. So black defended his pawn, and you allowed the a4 pawn to drop. This is kind of a kind of just a lapse in, in the thought process here, where you thought it wasn't a big deal your a4 pawn was hanging because of some other consideration. But when that other consideration was removed, you forgot to go back and make sure your pawn was defended, and you blundered the pawn, unfortunately. And I notice you're talking a lot about how much time you had left on your clock. Yeah, that definitely plays a role. One thing I would challenge you to do, if you have the time at Night Terran, play even longer time control games. I would like it to be possible for people to play online time controls where they're not going to end up in time trouble really at all. You know, play, play tournament length time control games where especially at this level, you know, time trouble is not really going to be a factor. And you can really judge your thought process kind of based on its own merits without saying, oh, I was just low on time. Um, of course, that can be hard to do because a lot of players don't have time to sit there for you know, three hours online and play chess. Um, but if you feel like the time is pressuring you at this time control, I don't know what the time control is. It might have been game in 30 or something, which is long by online standards, not really long by you know classical chess you know tournament condition standards. Um, but feel free to play longer time control games if you feel like it's not possible to really go through your thought process and really evaluate it perfectly at this time control. Um, that said, of course, time management is important. And it's good to, you know, uh, you know, still think about why you made this blunder and lost the A4 pawn. Um, it looks like it was just kind of a lapse in, in concentration kind of thing. But it's important to just kind of self-reflect there and ask yourself why that happened so you can kind of identify the mental triggers that led to that and kind of, you know, be on guard against it happening again. So white's down a pawn now, but by no means is the position hopeless for white. White still has a, you know, a large space advantage and better pieces. Um, white could also be thinking about swinging their knight around and into some of these weak white squares. In fact, that might have been a good possibility a couple moves ago, too. Instead of playing rook a to b1 here and really neglecting this pawn, something like knight h4 looks... oops, not there. Knight h4 looks pretty reasonable, trying to come into the light squares here. And it also takes away the g6 square temporarily. Anyway, bishop e3, and you lose that pawn, but now you play c5 and try to increase your kind of space advantage there. And black plays c6. Yeah, you say your engine hates that move. Yeah, it looks like it gives white a strong passed pawn, because now white can push past with d6, and it also kind of isolates this bishop, although I wonder if, if bishop b5 is a serious threat to be taken into consideration with this, this skewer. Uh, I wonder if we can even allow this. I'm looking at something like uh, d6. This is maybe a little far-fetched, though, and like some kind of exchange sacrifice here. Yeah, I feel like it's not really easy to justify an exchange sacrifice here. Oh, it looks like you actually mentioned this line in your analysis, actually, now that I'm looking at it. Rook takes b5 actually wins here. So if we're going back, if we play d6 and black plays bishop b5, this actually happened in the game. And it looks like I just missed a, an even simple attack. We can take this bishop not as an exchange sacrifice, but as the win of a rook. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely winning for white. So after d6, um, yeah, bishop b5 is a losing blunder, and you kind of missed that tactic. Uh, with, with rook takes b5 and queen d5. You give some other line here too. You say instead of d6, it would have been better to play c takes b6. Yeah, this, this does just win a pawn. Yeah, that's probably even better, like you said, because black doesn't have to fall for this bishop b5 thing on the other line. This just cleanly wins a pawn. Anyway, you do play d6 to get that passed pawn. Black plays bishop b5, and you miss the tactic. Uh, you play queen b3 check, though. Yeah, so it, it, it was never a real threat to win material, because, again, the black king is exposed, and usually there's always in-between checks, you know, if that's the case. King h8, rook fd1. So things kind of stabilize there. Both sides miss some tactics, and I think white still has a decent position here, even though you're down a pawn, just because you have that strong passed pawn. Bishop takes c5. You say your computer mentioned the move b7 here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, why not? Why not advance that pawn further and you can always, you know, capture this pawn later. Seems to make sense. A4, so your opponent has their own pass pawn too. They're, they're starting to push. Queen to c3. Yeah, and you mentioned that's a mistake and you would have rather played something like queen e6. Yeah, this seems to make a lot of sense because you're coming into some of these weak white squares around the king. Your knight can help out there. You could even lift a rook maybe at some point if it wasn't under attack to help out. And it helps support your, your past pawn, not only defending it here on the d6 square, but also possibly supporting it if it ever comes to d7. Whereas on queens, uh, with the queen on c3, it doesn't really accomplish a whole lot there. 
uh, these ponds are, are well protected, of course. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. So you play queen to c3, rook to f7, knight h4, rook d7, knight g6. Yeah, here black's kind of starting to gang up on, on, your, on your d6 pawn with a lot of their pieces. And I'm not sure white's going to get enough compensation anymore to really compensate for this after, you know, missing this queen e6 idea and missing some of those tactics earlier. Um, I think white is just kind of down a pawn now, but the game's far from over. King h7. And yeah, it looks like unfortunately here you blundered just a simple little, uh, simple little pin. You played knight e7 and you just missed that after knight takes e7, you're not going to be able to capture back because of your, of your back rank here, which is what happened in the game. D takes e7 and rook takes d1 and white gets mated. So it's unfortunate there that you uh, you made that blunder at the end. But let's talk about why though, because I don't think these things ever really happen kind of just because. So king h7, I'm sure you're a good enough player to see this tactic. After knight e7, you know, the knight takes and, and you're pinned and you lose a piece. So why did you miss it? I think this happened to me a lot too. Maybe not blunders quite like this, but it would often happen that I would be frustrated with my position. I would have a position that was not lost, maybe, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not completely lost, but I have a worse position. Maybe I, I used to have a better position, but now I'm clearly worse and my opponent has an advantage. And a lot of times I would blunder in these positions and lose very quickly. I kind of started calling it a blunder from hopelessness. You know, you, you're unhappy with your position. You want to make something happen. And you tend to be more careless in these kind of situations than you might have been otherwise or if you had an advantage. It can be really miserable to kind of defend these pawn down positions and have to keep finding good moves. And you start telling yourself things like, you know, why am I even bothering? And I think it might even happen subconscious, but, you know, people start thinking like that. You know, why am I bothering to find, you know, the very best move here and stay vigilant every turn? Even if I play perfectly, I might still lose. So why not, you know, get it over with? I don't think anyone consciously thinks like that, but it's a very real danger in a lot of these positions. It can be tough to defend in chess. It can be tough to defend when you have a bad position. So you just want to be aware that that mindset does exist and kind of guard against it. Because that, that's what I probably think happened, if I had to guess here, is that, you know, you were disappointed here that the position kind of didn't go the way you wanted and you kind of let your guard down and lost a lot quicker than you maybe could have. And of course, white still has chances to save this game. You're only down a pawn, and you have some good features of your position. The black king is exposed, the light squares are weak, you do have a passed pawn for the time being, and it is a kind of a hard pawn to defend. But yeah, always be on guard against that, you know, so-called blunder from hopelessness. But overall, knights are in good game. I would say you outplayed your opponent for most of the game, you really got a, you know, a big advantage out of the opening, um, it's unfortunate things didn't quite go the way that they could have, and then you accelerated your loss here with this blunder here. Um, and I would be curious to get your thoughts here of why you think you made this blunder. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, make sure to check out chesspathways.com for even more game analysis videos, and I will see you again soon.